good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Welcome to faculty, students, and staff from Central European University. I'm Michael Ignatiev, Rector and President. I want to extend a particularly warm welcome, as I always do, to members of the community from Budapest, from our fellow academic institutions, from people off the street, from all uh, citizens, whatever your language and origins. Um, welcome members of the diplomatic community who've been part of this series. For those who've not been here before, we've been doing this since January 19, 2017. We are now at lecture number 24, 25. Um, and this has been, I think, an experience of public education and public discussion of some importance. As you know, Central European University has what is called an open society mission, a mission that is committed to the idea of open societies. Uh, what do open societies mean? For us, it means a certain kind of citizen, a citizen who is skeptical, dispassionate, critical, uh, and above all, focused on the very difficult question of what knowledge is. How do we know what we know? How can we be sure of what we know? How can we use knowledge to inform public debate? How can we free ourselves, in fact, from the chains of ideological party pre, from illusion, and see reality in all its wonder, splendor, confusion, and difficulty clearly. So that's how we see the Open Society mission. And for now almost 16 months, we've uh, had a succession of very distinguished speakers puzzling with us, thinking through um, what Open Society means and what some of its new adversaries, its new antagonists, uh, mean and what their criticisms amount to. Um, I say this by prolegomena because um, those of you who follow this series may want to know that thanks to the superlative work of myself, <laughs> why not one, once, uh, Stefan Rock, who is a PhD uh, postgraduate at Central European University. Kinga Powell, without whom nothing happens around here. Where are you, Kinga? Kinga, well, raise your hand. Let people see you. Come on, wave. There you go. There you go. There you are. Um, uh, Central European University Press, and, and also 24 or 5 wonderful contributors, a book, a volume of this entire series will soon be completed. By soon, I mean in the next two or three weeks, and will be available for sale uh, at an appropriate price. My wife is suddenly laughing at me here. Uh, for sale, yes, but you know, moderate cost recovery. There, there we go. Um, I mention this to you. I mention this to you because those who follow the series may, may want to purchase uh, the volume because it'll allow us to extend this debate not only within our own community but around the world. And uh, we will, those of you who have registered for these events, as many of you have, will receive an email from us communicating to you about the existence of this volume and making uh, the volume possible for you. Let me now stop the preliminaries, except to say that we will have a reception as we always do afterwards. Um, uh, let me introduce the person you've all come to see and hear. Uh, one of the great figures of this university, a university professor, which is our highest honor now emeritus, one of the great uh, political philosophers, um, one of the great Hungarian patriots, one of the people who is a reminder of a particularly heroic moment in the Hungarian intellectual tradition. When you look at Janos Kisha's biography, you discover that between 1973 and 1989, he was barred from any official academic post in Hungarian academic life um, and made his living as a freelance translator. We tend to forget that there are among us 
people who have stood for academic freedom for a very long time, for intellectual freedom for a very long time, uh, and have, because they have stood for it, given courage to an entire society. If you ask why CEU exists at all, it exists because of a heroic tradition that preceded CEU. And Janusz Kisz is, of all members of our community, not the only one, but of all of them, the one who in some ways in one person incarnates that heroic Hungarian intellectual tradition which we respect. You will know that he has taught in many great universities the New School for Social Research. He's taught at NYU. He's also taught at a little place called CEU. And he is the author of, among other things, Politics as a Moral Problem and Constitutional Democracy, which gives him an international reputation as a uh, political thinker. His title is The Puzzle of a Liberal Democracy. I'd like us to give a very warm welcome to one of our own. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for this generous introduction, and thank you all for being here with me today. The topic, as it was announced, is the puzzle of illiberal democracy. And I will start right at the middle. <laughs> if you Google for the regimes Orban has built in Hungary and Kaczynski is building in Poland, you will find that the term which those regimes are most often characterized with is illiberal democracy. The popularity of illiberal democracy, I mean a term always take when I speak about illiberal democracy, uh, the quotation marks. The popularity of illiberal democracy comes with a puzzle. Even those who use it find the term awkward. Here is an article entitled, Illiberal Democracy Comes to Poland. And the first sentence, the introductory sentence of the article says, illiberal democracy is an unfortunate term. Now, if it is unfortunate, how could go it viral? According to Applebaum, this is because it is hard to think of a better one. But why should it be so hard? Don't be afraid. I just uh, want your attention not to be distracted by the text anymore. <laughs> I will argue that the puzzle of illiberal democracy is rooted in the way we generally tend to think about liberal democracy. V stands here for committed liberal Democrats, whether ordinary citizens, politicians, journalists, political analysts, or political thinkers. If I am right, then the puzzle of illiberal democracy gives us occasion to rethink our conception of liberal democracy. Because it is so widely shared, I will call it the mainstream conception. It is to revisit the mainstream conception of liberal democracy that I want to invite you today. To begin with, what kind of an animal illiberal democracy is? Now, Farid Zakaria's paper played a crucial role in making the term popular. Here is what he answers 
to the question. He doesn't aim to give a rigorous definition, but the main idea is reasonably clear. There are regimes which include in the normal workings periodic multi-party elections. I should add that these elections are to some degree competitive, at least to the extent that the outcome, the predictable outcome, the likely victory of the ruling party is not determined independently of the vote. So that there is no such a legal rule, for example, that would provide that only 40% of the parliamentary seats are open for competition or only one half of the president is open for competition, the other half is not. <laughs> so there are periodic elections with a modicum of competitivity. Now, this property sets these regimes apart uh, from the familiar kind of autocracies, those type of autocracies we are familiar with from the 19th century, and brings them in the neighborhood of democracies as we know them. But then there is the other property of these regimes, namely that uh, they are routinely ignoring constitutional limits on their power and depriving their citizens of basic rights and liberties. So they, uh, that, that property sets them apart from liberal democracies. Liberal democracies are characterized in part by strong constitutional checks on the government which uh, provide dependable or are, suppo uh, are supposed at least to provide dependable protection to uh, individual rights and liberties. So, hence the term illiberal democracy. Now let us see why the term is felt to be unfortunate. Now Jan Miller, whom I quote here, is not an advocate of using the term, but I believe that what he is saying is known by most of the users of the term, at least those who use it reflectively, like an Applebaum, and in fact explains the puzzlement. So what uh, Miller is speaking about? So, uh, concepts used by political analysts are not politically innocent. Political struggles, to a large extent, are struggles for the language of politics. Those who win the battle for framing a disputed issue have good chances to win the battle over the issue itself. Illiberal democracy is a poor conceptual asset in the struggle against the adversaries of liberal democracy. Its use is actually counterproductive. It allows illiberal leaders to claim the mantle of democracy and attack liberal constitutionalism in its name. It 
also allows them to blur the distinction between liberalism, a political worldview uh, in a perpetual dispute with its rivals, conservatism on the one hand and socialism on the other. With liberal democracy that is accepted not just by liberals but by most conservatives and contemporary socialists as well. So current originally as a means for delegitimizing would-be autocrats. The term is easily appropriated by them for self-legitimation. Now here is the political credo of a self-proclaimed illiberal democrat. This is a, uh, an expert, uh, ex, excerpt, sorry. This is an excerpt from a speech Beata Szydło, then Prime Minister of Poland, has given the day the Polish president vetoed uh, the bill on the judiciary. Now, what is it that Szydło says? I won't read it, you can read it yourself, I will rather interpret it. What she says is that in a democracy, the representatives elected by the people must have the final say on what the rule of law requires. We should not have the rule of lawyers. We should have the rule of law. And that means that the elected representatives of the people, the government, and the parliament must gain control over the judiciary. That is how real democracy is. Judiciary must be under the control of the people. It is under the control of the people if it is under the control of the representatives of the people. Now, critics attack the aspiration of illiberal democracy to represent true democracy as demagogic. Uh, and I agree, it is. Unfortunately, however, this was the starting claim I made and I repeat it now. The illiberal claim is given unintended support by what I called the mainstream conception of liberal democracy. So it is time, I think, that I provide a summary of what I think the mainstream conception is. <coughs> democracy is a system of procedures for public decision making. It is based on the principle that citizens have a right to participate on equal terms in the decision making about the laws and policies to which they will be subjected. So far, uh, I agree with the mainstream conception. Now, equal participation is a highly abstract principle. It needs specification. It needs specific rules that should apply to the democratic process so that if it conforms to them, it is truly democratic. These are familiar rules like universal and equal ballot, freedom of expression, assembly and association, freedom of access to information on public matters, free and fair regular competitive elections, and so on. Now, uh, what matters, what, what will matter for us in all this is 
that all these criteria refer to the internal properties of the procedure. They are independent of the outcome. They don't relate to the outcome of the procedure. And the claim is that whatever the outcome, whatever the content of the law or policy adopted, if the procedure followed the democratic principle closely enough, it is democratic and the outcome commands democratic legitimacy, whatever its content should be. Democratic decisions are binding, truly democratic decisions, are binding irrespective of their content. Everybody, including the dissenting minority, have to, comp uh, have to comply with the... Yes, correct. Uh, everybody, including uh, the dissenting minority, have to comply with the majority decision. Thus, democratic majorities have the right that the minority complies with their decision. To put it briefly, democracy is majority rule. Consider now the liberal part of liberal democracy uh, as the mainstream conception uh, entails it. Liberalism uh, insists that individuals have certain basic rights. They have these rights independently of and prior to being legislated. And they must be respected. They command respect from everybody, including democratic majorities. But all the democratic procedural norms, as we know them, taken together do not guarantee that the decision output will respect those rights. If so, then individual rights must be protected even against the decisions of democratic majorities. Democratic government on its own is not enough. Liberal constitutionalism is also needed. That is, the rule of law, separation of powers, constitutional entrenchment of basic <coughs> rights, and an independent ju judiciary capable of supervising the constitutionality of legislative and governmental <coughs> acts. Thus, there are two distinct sets of political institutions, democratic and liberal. Liberal democracy unites them in one single institution. This is, in a nutshell, the mainstream conception of liberal democracy. Now, how does it lend support to what self-proclaimed illiberal Democrats say about democracy? In two ways. First, it makes it perfectly conceivable for a regime to leave individuals, especially if they belong to vulnerable minorities, without protection for their liberal rights, and at the same time fully comply with the democratic requirements. So a regime can be democratic and not liberal in the sense we defined liberal democracy. So illiberal democracy is at least possible. Opponents of liberal constitutionalism can still be Democrats. And this is precisely the problem Jan Müller draws our attention to. And it is what Orban insists is the case. You probably all know these two sentences from uh, 
Orbán's speech as of 19, uh, 2014. A democracy is not necessarily liberal. It can be illiberal as well. What is worse, the mainstream conception lends some support to a stronger claim illiberal Democrats make. Recall <coughs> Beata Shidwell's sentences. Her statement that has the implicit claim that the case is not that illiberal democracy is a form of de democracy side by side with liberal democracy, only different in the aspects related to liberal constitutionalism. Uh, the fact is that liberal, illiberal democracy is true democracy and liberal democracy is not democracy at all. Of course, you surprise, surprise, Orban also shares the so stronger claim. At some point he declared that his illiberal regime is a democracy, while liberal democracy is liberal non-democracy. <laughs> now, on what grounds do I claim that the mainstream conception lends support, some support at least, to what they are saying? Consider how the mainstream argument for liberal democracy goes. Democratic majorities have the right that the minority complies with their decision. Individuals have the right that their interests of great moral importance are protected. The two rights may clash. Suppose in a case of conflict, liberal rights are enforced against the decision of the majority. When this happens, majority rule suffers a setback and it is a moral loss. In other words, protection of liberal rights is not additive to democratic decision making. It comes at the cost of curtailing majority rule, that is democracy. Liberal democracy is somewhat democratic, but not fully so. Of course, in exchange, Individual rights are better protected than they are in an illiberal <coughs> democracy. And liberals might make the balance or might find that the balance is overall morally favorable. But as a democracy, illiberal democracy is or can be more perfect. Now, I can see two avenues to challenge the truth of uh, the illiberal claims. First, one way to proceed is to show that illiberal democracy is not genuinely majoritarian. So you don't challenge, don't question majoritarianism, the majoritarian principle itself, you just claim and show that illiberal democracy is not genuinely um, majoritarian. Uh, the role, so the argument could go, of constitutional checks and balances is not reducible to that of protecting basic rights. They also protect the integrity of the political process, and they are needed for the political process integrity uh, is protected. Once they are incapacitated, the electoral rules can be bent in favor of the governing party. 
The press can be brought under government control and transformed into a means of propaganda, hate mongering, and manipulation. Civil watchdogs can be harassed and intimidated. Uh, so far, we don't see them intimidated, but we see that they, in fact, can be harassed, and so on and so forth. As a consequence of such distortions in the process, the electorate, minority and majority alike, lose their control over the outcome of the electoral process and over the legislative and governmental acts. Democracy comes to an end. This critique, I believe, is of great importance, but it is not sufficient to meet the, fully meet the illiberal challenge. Why not? Because illiberals do not merely defend the regime type that liberals have good reasons to reject. They also attack the regime type we have good reasons to defend. And as long as we don't leave behind, I will argue, the majoritarian premise, the mainstream conception shares with the liberals, we will not be secure in the conviction that we have an answer to them. Now, an argument against the majoritarian reading of liberal democracy is available, although it has not become part of the mainstream thinking. Some of you, even if you are not philosophers, are familiar with Dworkin's idea. Since in 2011, he came to this university and he has spoken about the very same topic I am now discussing with you. In what follows, I will sketch the outlines of an argument that is inspired by his views. The argument has two parts. Its first part attacks the claim that democracy is majority rule. Oops. It is true that in the absence of consensus, democratic decisions should be typically majoritarian. If you want, after the lecture, I will tell you why I say typically, and not always. It is true that Democrats tend to believe that the majority has the right, that their decision is binding for everybody. But it is not true that the majority has, in fact, such a right. The reason why democratic decision rules should be typically majoritarian is that consensus is rarely, if ever, achievable. But the right to be the ultimate author of the law resides in the citizenry as a whole, not in the majority. Why? Remember the statement uh, with which I started the introduction into the mainstream conception and about which I said I agree with it. It is true, the egalitarian statement, that democracy is a political system where each and every systems, uh, citizens will and views matters and matters equally and each and every citizen has an equal part in the political process. Uh, each citizen has the right to be part author of the laws and policies of their common state. If so, then the right of authorship is held, cannot be held by the majority. It must reside in the citizenry as a whole, in the totality of each 
and every citizen. So it is the citizenry as a whole that has the right to give law to itself via a majoritarian process. Now, this may sound very abstract and hard to follow, but here is a simple example. When a bill is tabled to the parliament and it carries the votes after discussion, the votes of the majority of the MPs, 50% plus one, say. We don't say that the majority adopted the law. We say the parliament adopted the law. So the majority has given the decisive vote but the decision is attributed to the parliament. Similarly, as a whole, as a body, similarly and more generally, we could say that the majority cast the decisive votes for a collective decision, but it is the collectivity, the political community as a whole that takes the decision. But this is a very large claim. And in order for it to be true, important conditions must obtain. It must be the case that decisions adopted by the vote of the majority can be attributed to the citizenry as a whole. Otherwise, they, are, they might be legally correct, but do not command democratic legitimacy. Now it comes to the second part of the argument. It attacks the sharp separation of decision procedure <coughs> from decision output. You might remember when I introduced the mainstream conception, I was saying that the egalitarian criteria that apply to the democratic decision process are related to properties internal to the procedure and have nothing to do with the output, right? Now, here is then the second part of the argument. A decision adopted by the votes of the majority cannot be legitimately attributed to the citizenry as a whole if members of the minority have a good reason to disown it. Normally, when a democratic decision is adopted and I voted against, I would say, I voted against this law. But we together adopted it nevertheless. Okay. I, normally, I don't say, I voted against, so it is not my law. I need to say more. But I may have reasons to disown it. For example, it might be the case that I was denied an equal part in the political process, right? Uh, my views have been judged as not worthy of equal attention to the uh, 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 views of others, or I uh, might have less votes than others have, or I might have complete, been completely excluded from the vote. So there are procedure-relating reasons for me to disown the law. But there are other reasons for me to disown the law as well, or for citizens in general. They can disown the decision if they are not treated by the output, by the law that is being adopted, with equal concern for their interests 
and equal respect for their rights. So if, oh sorry, I have to confess this is the first time and just for you that I use poor for your presentation. I think you need another slide. Excuse me? Yes, sir. Don't you need another slide? No. No, no, sir. sir. No. <laughs> this is what I do, certainly don't at this point. Uh, I, am, I am just expanding on the same thing. So if the law systematically disadvantages a minority group, or if particular pieces of legislation cause a grave setback to their personal interests of great moral importance, they have a legitimate reason to disown it. Thus, because the decision procedure is not democratic unless no citizen has a good reason to disown it. And because dissenting citizens may disown the decision on output regarding grounds, the assessment of the procedure cannot be fully separated from the assessment of the output. Dworkin's, claims, Dworkin's claim follows. The conflict between democratic decision and liberal rights is spurious. Decisions that are adopted in a procedure that secures an equal say to each citizen may still violate, justify individual claims against interference and discrimination. That's correct. But such decisions, as I hope to have shown to you, don't carry democratic legitimacy. They cannot be attributed to the citizenry as a whole. When they are being struck down, democracy does not suffer a moral loss. It does not suffer a loss at all. Overruling collective decisions that violate liberal rights does not compromise democracy. It provides for more democracy, not less. So the conception of liberal democracy I was arguing for does not lend support to the stronger illiberal claim that liberal democracy is a defective form of democracy. This is the first conclusion of my lecture. There is a second conclusion. The weaker illiberal claim can be rejected too. The specious illiberal democracy does not exist. Even if an illiberal regime satisfied to a sufficient degree the requirements that apply to the internal properties of the decision procedure, it would not qualify as a democracy. Thank you, that was it.